So welcome everybody, welcome to TechEd, welcome to TechEd Madrid. Is Madrid a good place to do a TechEd? Amsterdam is better? Yeah. Why? It was raining. No, it's not the weather that's better. It's not the weather that's better? Okay, I should not ask for details, I guess. <laughs> there, there are other things that make your stay in Amsterdam more pleasant, right? <laughs> That's not an excuse, is it? Uh, so, welcome to sunny Madrid. Um, I was talking to a friend who went to build conference in San Francisco instead to this beautiful conference here. And he told me two days ago it was raining in San Francisco. So any more questions, you've done the right choice. Welcome in sunny Madrid, even though we don't see the sun that much in here. But I hope you will still survive. Um, I'm aware that it's only me between you and your lunch break, so I will try to stick on my uh, designated time. Um, I'm Nino, in case you uh, have not seen me speaking here or anything else. I specialize in Team Foundation Server. For the last seven years, I'm doing this full-time, so I help people set up a team environment. And more and more, this is not a technical question on how to install and configure TFS. This is getting easier and easier. It's, on the one hand, the feature richness. There are so many features, I could not list them by heart anymore. I'm doing this full-time. So to have a pragmatic approach, how to start with that. And more and more features are... Um, you need some process behind it, or at least an idea how you want to use this. I mean, you can create requirements with TFS, and there's a large text field. So what do you put in into that requirements text field? Who knows how to write requirements really well? One, two, three. Um, who thinks that it's possible to write a perfect requirement? Nobody. Who thinks you can learn to write a Perfect requirement. Oh, you think it's possible? Interesting, huh? Um, yeah, we will try to dig into that topic as well. So this demo or this uh, presentation is not too much crowded with demos. It's like at least half we're talking about the why and why Microsoft has built TFS the way it is. I'm not working for Microsoft. I'm just an MVP helping them to implement the actual tools they built with real customers. So when Microsoft stops caring, this is the moment where you start using TFS. This is where I come to play. So if you need help with a real-life implementation, it's uh, me or my colleagues. We have over 100 MVPs worldwide now. Let us know. So now is the funniest part for me of this session. Who joined my session last year at Tech at Amsterdam? You were there at least in Amsterdam. We know that for sure now. Have you joined my session maybe? Not good for you, actually, because I'm checking on the homework. Who was in my session? Who, can, who at least who remembers he attended my session? One, two, three. You remember the homework by any chance? You don't? Man. Luckily, I have those slides with me, so we can go into the presentation from last year, which actually looked into the technical side of how to do continuous delivery and continuous deployment. You know, there was a session yesterday, you can still watch the recording if you haven't uh, attended it, about the technical parts, how to set up, build, lab, and all that stuff. And the reason why you want to do this is to shorten down the cycle time, right? The time between the customer wants something from you, you do all the testing, development, architecture, magic, throw it over to your IT, and magically the new feature is usable for your client. That's the cycle time. And we focused on the time between check-in, especially, and the customer is happy. And everything that happens in between is the process. And there's a tools part from TFS, and there's a process part. When should you be doing what? Then I told you that it's really important to define done. Most teams I have worked with have no definition of done in place. This is interesting. So this means if another developer does the same thing, he does more or maybe less, because he has a different definition of when he says, I'm done. Many developers have a de definition of done, which means it works on my machine. Maybe like it compiles, and that's it. Maybe it's checked in into version control would be a nice addition. How about testing? Is that part of it? Is it not? If you have a team, even like with two, three, or four developers, and ask them to define a definition of done, this will be a lengthy and interesting discussion. But you have to go through that. If you don't do this, it really depends on the individual developer. When he says, I'm done, um, your estimates will be very interesting, because every developer thinks about something different when he gives an estimate. And the quality of your software will depend on when something is developed. If it's developed at the beginning of the cycle, you have a lot of time, you do more testing because you have time, right? I mean, why should you hurry? At the end of the cycle, two days before the release, you will skip a few tests because you don't have time. 
So the definition of done guarantees you that you have a constant quality bar, and everything that's below that done is just not done, per definition of the word. It doesn't mean that your definition of done has to be a super list of thousand things, including everything you always wanted to do in future. It's more the minimum bar. We always compile things. Do we allow compiler warnings? Yes, no, maybe. You define this on a definition of done. You post it on the wall, ideally. And ideally, you also automate the checking, the validation of that list. So write it down, make it explicit. The DOD, the definition of done. Then you get a constant quality, not something that varies between developers and time. It's important for your estimates because now all the developers, all people involved know what we actually estimated, that it's not just the development time but includes some form of testing. Maybe unit testing is part of your definition of done, but any form of testing has to be there, at least some form. Even if it's just clicking through the application, something around testing has to be on the definition of done. It might be influenced by what your company wants to do in all your products. Like if you would probably work for Microsoft, it's Windows update needs to be able to update your software is probably a requirement they have for all teams. You want something that is measurable. So one product owner once told me um, for the definition of done, he would like the software to look good. That's a nice requirement. It's a little bit hard to measure what looks good and what doesn't. You can solve it though by asking him every time like, is this what you wanted? Oh, yes, this looks good. Okay, then it looks good. We've done the check, but you can't automate this really. So automation would be tricky with it looks good. Yeah, automated, we said that already. And this was actually the homework. It was um, a step-by-step -step guide what you can do with your own products. It was start with put really everything in source control that you want to hand off to your customer, like the database schema, um, any documentation, the code, uh, the setup, whatever you need for your customer, put it in version control. Then add automated build. It costs you five minutes to set up the automated build server in TFS. Add continuous integration, which basically just means your build is triggered all each time when you check in. And you can choose between the optimistic and pessimistic continuous integration model. Optimistic means it's checked in. The build server verifies that it does not work, but now it's checked in already. Or you do the pessimistic approach, which is called continuous um, gated check-in. And the gated check-in will make sure the build server runs first, and then it gets checked in, or you never checked it in. It gets rejected before check-in, actually. By the way, if you didn't know, there's a small tip for TFS users. You can actually combine both by using the normal continuous integration, the optimistic one. And if you think there's something in your workspace, in your local workspace, you want to have verified by your build server, you can directly contact your build server for a so-called private build. And he will run that private build for you and tell you if this would work or not. And then you can define if you want to check in or not. So define your definition of done. Who has a definition of done in place, by the way? Oh, a lot. What do you have on your definition of done? All that stuff in here? Even more? Something UI related, maybe? Tests. You have tests? What kind of tests do you have on your definition of done, sir? Well, you have unit tests? User you, you like user acceptance or yeah. user acceptance tests? OK. Any other forms of testing? Yeah? We use uh, in production done when it's in production. Oh, it's done when it's in production? Oh, this is interesting because like, the developer feels responsible until the moment it's in production. Yeah, You can, by the way, as a tip, your developers will hate you, though, your colleagues. Um, you can even extend that and tell them it's done after it survived a week of production. I like that definition a lot. Uh, some internet uh, websites do that. Like, it's not done because you checked it in and it's on the web server. Actually, the interesting part starts now. And like, the support will call you the first week, and then they will take over. I like this one very, very much. Yeah. That's an interesting one. Uh, did you automate your definition of done? Was that possible so far? Automation? No? Yes. Not yet? Not yet? Yeah. Partly? Yeah. Yeah, probably it's partly and you try to automate more and more. There's a lot you can do with TFS. If you have not looked in uh, the lab management part, when, if you know where to click, then after half an hour you can actually set up a lot of test machines where your automated tests will run and set up and deploy your software, everything automatically. I mean, automatically means you write the deployment scripts and Microsoft will run the, uh, the code on those machines. But yeah, you can do a lot with lab management. If you haven't looked at for um, automation, do that, please. And then you can also measure your success by looking at those two metrics. One is the cycle time. How long does it take from an idea to the in-production pro um, 
yeah, to basically the in-production state of that idea. And how long does it take you to mitigate any issues like bugs or like the website went slower if it's a website or anything um, problem related? Okay, this was the homework for last time. Who has not done it has even more homework for next year. Um, it's on the slide deck, so feel free to use this as a guide if you like. So the next thing I just want to a little bit show you, because TFS has been there for seven years, and it's really, really large as a, as a uh, base, as a code base, and as a product too. And the reason is software development is super complicated, right? There's no, not just the developer sitting in the middle, but there's the testing part. There's architecture at some point. There's the in production phase, where we put something in production, where we validate it on production, where it lives in production. And there's, of course, at the beginning, a lot of talking with customers. Are we on the right track? Are we doing the right thing? You know that usually there are first requirements, then there's code, hopefully. But I've seen a few teams where they start coding and they wait for the requirements to come later. I will not ask who does that. It's not fair, I guess, but um, it's reality, I assume. So TFS, with every new version of Visual Studio, try to target more and more of that application lifecycle chain. And it started with just having like the first TFS. Then in 2010, it went to look at the relationship between developer and tester and the relationship between developer and architect. And in 2012, the current release, which is out there, we're looking at the stakeholder and developer. Stakeholders, everyone involved in the product, like the guy that actually pays you, the users, everyone who's really affected by a product, and the operations team, the guys that put it in production and that keep it in production and do support for your product. Even if it's a Windows Forms application, you still have a production phase. It's just probably a more support approach and not a website you're keeping up and running. So this was the focus in Visual Studio 2012, and this is what we'll be looking at, at this, um, in this session. This was my favorite slide from Microsoft. As I said, I'm not working for Microsoft, but I have stolen this slide from a beta presentation before TFS 2012 actually got out. The interesting part about this slide is there's one detail that has never been part of a Microsoft slide before. It's right in the middle. It's the customer. It's you. Microsoft discovered the customer last year. You can be happy now. Is that happy? OK, we try again. You can be happy now. Coffee is uh, outside on the left, if you haven't seen so far. So because you were not too enthusiastic, Microsoft got that feedback of you. And they had an agency that was supposed to redo all the presentations into the new modern Windows 8 look and feel. And as you know, Windows 8 is more simplified. It focuses on the important things. And how do you do that? By removing unnecessary, not important things of your slides. So the final slide looked like this. You were not happy enough. See, this is what you got. The customer's gone. No, it's actually not gone. The customer's everywhere. And it would not be fair to put him in the middle like the supervisor or something. He has to be everywhere. In every phase, we can actually verify, are we still doing what my customer wants with the precious time we have? Or are we just doing something and we hope he likes it? And then at the end, we will figure out that he doesn't. This is one of those continuous value delivery software development um, slides. The interesting part here is there are three sections. There's a defined section where you talk and try to understand what your customer actually wants. There's a section of develop, where you do developing, testing, architecture, everything that's kind of technical, continuous integration, continuous delivery. And there's operations, where you put it into production and you ask your client, now where it's in production, is that really what you want it? Many things can go wrong here. Software development is super complicated, especially at the beginning, because if the requirements were wrong, if we didn't 100% understand our customer demands, Whatever we program, we do great architecture, great coding, great testing. It's all not, not worth at all if it doesn't solve the customer problem. So we have to be a little bit more careful, but not spend more time, ideally, on the requirements on the idea side. The reason why those are circles on those slides, by the way, all the time is those are not phases as they used to be because they're running all the time. This is why we use circles or cycles for it. So you're developing all the time. You're not stopping development for a couple of weeks. You're releasing, hopefully, all the time at some point if you go down to short cycles. And even the product backlog and the define um, section should also have a circle because you're all the time talking with your customer like, OK, we deployed the new update. So what's the next important thing we should be working on? So you refine the plan all the way. It's, not, it's never done. You're doing it all at the same time. There's somebody doing the requirements all the time. There's somebody developing all the time. There's somebody releasing all the time. 
ideally, as I said. Not every team uh, does it like that. You probably know that Microsoft is trying this, at least in the developer division. They try to convince all their developers to do three-week sprints and to release it into production, which means there's a Team Foundation server online, TF service, and they release every three weeks. Does that always work great? Well, you can choose um, how to... Uh, how to grade uh, how good it works, but it's, it's interesting, and you have to change a lot of things, how you do work, how you do architecture, how you do testing, to make this possible. For example, if you don't have unit tests, how do you want to test that you have not screwed up anything else in your application? You do a small change here, and something doesn't work at the other end. How do you want to ensure that this is uh, the case, right? So unit tests is one way of helping you here. And once again, the two metrics, cycle time and mean time to repair, this is how you could measure your success if you would want to. So let's look at the first um, area. So I think we learned already, if you only do what your customer actually asked you for, I'm not sure you will have a happy customer. By the way, is that our ultimate goal, to make our customer happy? Would you agree? I mean, not everyone agrees, that's why I asked. I mean, making the customer happy, is that a, the goal, kind of? Making money? Mm. But if your customer is not happy, will you make money? Oh, sometimes yes, actually, but it depends on your customer, I guess, yeah. The, the budget, what did you say? Uh, well, making the customer happy while staying in the budget. Oh, while st making him happy while staying in the budget is nice, yeah. And staying maybe in the schedule, may maybe a little bit, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if you look at a customer and if you look at yourself, there are different levels of happiness. One is like, yeah, you, you delivered what you promised, kind of. And even if you if you reaching that level is not easy, but you just did like yeah you did okay, and then there's like delighting your customer or surprising your customer in a positive sense. We often surprise our customers, but rather with bugs and other things that should not be in the software. Like what is this? Uh, I'm sorry, we will fix that next. Release. So surprising in a positive way would be nice, but I think we are often far away in our projects because of time pressure to really surprise and, and uh, delight our customers. Anyway, so if it's not. Um, doing exactly what he says, then there's something we have to do in software development to find out what does he really want, especially if your customer doesn't really know what he wants. Um, think of um, a scenario buying a car online. If you buy a car online, you can see the, the car you will buy, you can configure it, you can choose a color, but can you really imagine how this car will look like in front of you? Then you buy it, you get your car, you look at it, and you say, well, the color looked really different on my uh, on my computer, I don't like that color anymore. So once you see something, it's super, it's a small car, yeah? you just buy one of those very small cars for the same price of a large car, nice one, yeah. Um, so it, it, you can really good, you, you can be really good at imagining something, but it's even better to have it right in front of you, to be able to touch it, and then you know, actually this is not what I wanted, but I was not able to write on the requirements what I wanted. So customers know what they don't want. So it's, it, it might make sense, if they tell your requirement, to somehow write it down in a different form, show it back to them, and if it looks like this, would you buy it? And then they will tell you yes or no. This still has to be quick. We don't want to lose months of verifying, right? But we don't want to start coding if we're not exactly sure that we have maybe misunderstood our client. How do you write requirements? Is it uh, text? Is it uh, with a lot of images? How do you do requirements management? Engineering. It's a combination of text and... Yeah. Markups, yeah. You specify all the requirements point by point. Um, how much text do you tend to write? Like one page or 10 pages or a huge Word doc or where do you? For a requirement, single requirement. Yes. Not that much text? Half a page, yeah. That seems pretty good actually, yeah. I've um, met a company, they're writing 80 page requirements documents for obviously a large module, but they have 80 pager documents. Have you ever seen a developer reading a lot of text, how this looks like? It's called selective reading. Just start turning pages and at some point, oh, this looks interesting, let's copy this sentence. Go ahead, oh, this one, I think I need this one. He will actually start collecting the information that is really important. What he's doing is he's writing a user story or a product backlog item, even if he's not uh, calling it that way, with only the essential information he now needs as a checklist to implement this. So the goal is not to write more text, because the more you write, the more it can be misunderstood. The goal is to write a little bit less text, maybe, and this might help you. So what else can we do? You already mentioned that um, there are different 
things you can do, and all just to not get misunderstandings. I mean, just imagine the idea what the customer wanted goes to so many different people, right? The customer says what he wants, then we have somebody who, who writes this down, then a developer has to understand it, it's Hester has to understand it, and so on and so forth. And this is how, it, how you might end up if you haven't seen that one before. So we really want to make sure no misunderstandings, and I think the best way to do that is to use images, maybe some drawings on the whiteboard, whatever you like, or to go into mockups, or even go into storyboards. If you go into storyboarding, it's a, basically you do a script. Just imagine Hollywood, if they create a new movie idea, they don't get the funding and they, until they can tell you what the idea actually is. So how do they write down a whole movie? They don't write text because no one will read this. They create a presentation, maybe a PowerPoint, whatever. And they're trying to combine the most important parts of this movie. What will be cool about this movie? What are the different stages? So you can imagine the whole movie, not about the details of scene number 14 or something. It's about the whole flow through the movie script at the end. And this is what we can do with storyboarding. Storyboarding is part of 2012 Visual Studio and TFS. And it's one of the features that is really underrated. You can use this completely without TFS. You can use this with an old version of TFS. You can just start using it. And the teams I have seen that started using storyboarding were immediately happier with their requirements without changing anything else in their process. Even if they have the crappiest process ever, that tool already helped them a little bit. So you, have mi you might have seen this already, but let me show you what is uh, really cool and important about storyboarding. And let me open this up real quick. A lot of open windows here. There you go with the demo machine. So let's say we work at Microsoft and the Visual Studio team and we got a new requirement. The requirement is advanced assistance when writing code. Now we can start, um, as, I, as we know, we can start writing some blah blah description, which is okay. You always should have a short description of what you're what you're going to do. And you should always have acceptance criteria. There's nothing more important than acceptance criteria. This is like a definition of done, like we've done for the team before, but now it's a definition of done for this item. So when is this item complete, this requirement, when those conditions are met? You really write down a checklist of you have to do this and that and this. And as a tester and as a developer, your job gets really easy. You don't have to ask yourself, okay, what exactly do I have to do? It's on that list. You can have the worst headache ever and you can code this down. And you can be a tester. You exactly know if I test this and this and this that it works, I know it's well tested. So it really helps a lot, but not too many teams start with acceptance criteria. Is anyone using acceptance criteria? Yeah, less than half, but still good to see that it's actually moving up the number. I like that. Very good. You have a good um, and pleasant experience with it? Was it good? Did it help you a little bit? Is it hard to write them? Difficult? Oh, yes. Good. So they could be something, um, I would always start it like, you are 100% done with this requirement when? And then you do a checklist of things like um, when typing in VS, the new feature is immediately offering help. Um, it should appear after the first word has been entered. Our company logo has to be in the upper right corner. Whatever you want, it's on this list. This is actually the contract between the team and your requirement side of things. Okay, this is nice, but let's start with storyboarding. You can immediately start storyboarding from the requirement or product backlog item form. It will open up your favorite project management tool besides Excel, it's uh, PowerPoint. Microsoft did a few surveys and they found out that most people know how to use PowerPoint, especially those people who actually write down the requirements, who are not technically focused. Uh, they only basically know a couple of tools. It's Excel, Outlook, and PowerPoint. So this is the knowledge of a typical um, business analyst. So this is why Microsoft chose this one here. Who's using storyboarding already, maybe? One, two, three. Okay, so a lot of homework for you guys. You have a shape library where you can choose a lot of ready-to-use shapes. The problem with these shapes is they look like actual controls, like a data grid looks like a data grid. The problem is your customer might focus on too much detail on the small things. So what I would advise you to do is actually open up the storyboard shapes. It will open up a link 
it's a little bit hidden at the bottom actually. If you look at the bottom right, you see we have storyboard shapes online here. And if you go there, it's like a uh, small shop, like an app store where you can download more shapes for free or paid shapes. And you have pretty cool shapes down there. Like sketchy shapes that look like they were drawn or you have uh, common storytelling shapes that look like you're telling a story and help you with that. And iPhone shapes, whatever, and um, sketchy shapes, those were those one. Storytelling max character shapes. So you have like this small guy explaining the software if you like to. So a lot of things you can just use, put into that library, and start from there. If you have an existing software and you want to propose a new feature, you can just copy the existing software. Let's do that. I have an existing software here, this one, and we're proposing a new feature, like code assistance for this tool. Maybe we need a title. Bless you, code assistance. Assistance while writing code. This is maybe product backlog item number one, two, three. So dear customer, you asked us to advance um, the code writing and help you with this. So this is how we came up with, we think while you're writing code, something should pop up to really help you. Um, and we prepared something that I think you will like. It was very successful in other products too. So how about this, right? So while you write, Clippy will come up and help you a little bit with writing code. And then you can actually click on Clippy and it will open up a alerts box right after my PowerPoint starts reacting again. There we go. An alert dialog will come up and will ask you, are you really sure you want Clippy to help you write code? And you can choose between no and maybe. And if you say no, or if you say no, you get, go back to the last slide, places in this document, slide three, and if you go to maybe, you jump to the next slide, which is slide five, which will get you the next dialogue. Or basically, we can probably crash the application, can't we? How does a crashed application look like this, right? Clippy needs to crash too. And we will add a text box application frozen. Probably you will not um, design features that are supposed not to work like I do. You probably have better ideas. Uh, one last thing I want to add is the mouse cursor. If you try to simulate user behavior, you would add mouse cursor or animations when he writes something into a text box. You can use the general and uh, animation features, custom animations you know from PowerPoint. Why is it crashing all the time though? I've never seen PowerPoint crashing. You never know, it's probably the machine I use. So here's the mouse pointer and we add some animation, add animation of type, let's take a custom path. So the custom path is as a user you immediately click on Clippy like this. Yep. And now this is ready to present. So you go to a customer and say, you asked me and I just want to quickly verify if I understood you correctly, dear customer. So this is how Visual Studio looks like today. Once you enter mail.send and you probably want to send an email, Clippy will come up asking you, hey, I guess you want to write an email. May I assist you with this? And you will click on Clippy. Awesome, isn't it? And you click on it and he asks if you're really, really sure and now you can choose. Either you say no and you go back or you click on Clippy again and this time you say maybe and it crashes your app. This is storyboarding. It has one great disadvantage though. If you present an application like this, your customer thinks it's already done and asks you, why do you need two months to implement it? It's working, right? You can even add VBA to this. You can save this as an exe file. This is a new application type, PowerPoint apps. Please do not tell that anyone, right? We don't want PowerPoint VBA apps. But anyway, this is how we would do it. And you see, we were focusing not on any detail on those screens, on those mockups. We were focusing on the flow. How many times do I have to click? Do I actually have to click? Is there a message box coming up or is something opening in the same window? You're talking about the big things, the important flow through the application. And you're trying to understand this one and uh, yeah, try to mitigate any misunderstood things. Everything we've done so far, you could do it without TFS. You can just grab this PowerPoint file, send it to a customer. He does not to 
He does not need to install anything. I have installed a PowerPoint plugin here, but your customer does not need to. He can just draw with a red uh, pencil if he wants to comment on it and send it back to you. And if you want to, you can go to storyboarding and connect this to your Team Foundation server. In order to do that, you have to save this on your SharePoint site. So it has to be a uh, location that everyone can access, like SharePoint. can also be a network drive, though. So let me connect to, basically, I'll put it in here, connect to my SharePoint site, local site, and let's call this code assistance while writing code, PPTX, save. And now since we started the storyboarding out of the Team Foundation server web access, he already knows, shall I link the storyboard with the work item number two? Yes, please. So he automatically created the link. We can see it here. The whole storyboard is associated with the requirement. And on the other end, if we refresh it here, you see we have a connection, a link to a storyboard that resides on the SharePoint side. So once again, if you haven't tried it, it really helps um, your customer and it helps you to find out what he actually wants and how to do that. No misunderstandings at the beginning is a great start of a new product or of a new feature. But now let's go into the details. I have a few screenshots of everything. Here's a storyboard screenshot so you can remember what I showed you. Let's go one further, priorities. Before you can start, you have to decide what to do first. The reason is most teams I've seen get more new ideas in than this team can possibly get done within a certain time frame. So there are always more ideas than you have capacity to actually do, right? Anyone who has not more incoming ideas? That would be lovely, right? So at some point, since it's your time you're spending, you have to do the most important stuff first. What is the most important stuff? You have to find this out, and then you have to order all your things to do the most important stuff first. There are two problems. Never let your developers choose the order of when to do what, especially from the requirement side, right? If you give, give a developer 10 things that are equally important, what will he start with? The easiest and most fun part, yes. And this is logically the one that has a lot of customer value, right? Mostly it has zero customer value. I've seen so many apps, Windows applications, where the developer started with the help about dialogue. Because he thought that's fun and he can test his infrastructure if it's working and it's super cool. And the customer said, there's nothing in there for me. So you have to find out what's important for the customer and you have to do the sorting. Somebody has to do the sorting. Ideally one person and not the developer. Next thing about priorities. Never ask your customer about priorities like give me your priority. Because a priority is one, two, or three, right? Those are priorities. And of course everything is priority one. Otherwise, he would not bother you with that requirement. I mean, he's paying a lot of money for software development. Why would he give you something that is of low importance? He's only giving you high important items. So he's not able to do prioritization. So we're not talking about real priorities here. We're talking about ordering. We have to put things in order. It's like if you have a tunnel with only one lane, only one car can be in that tunnel at the time, at least go in there at the time. So you have to have an order who goes in first. If something goes wrong, hopefully not in the tunnel, but in the software tunnel. So what you need are two things. You need one responsible guy to bring things in order. So he's talking with the one or many clients, depending on how many clients and stakeholders you have, trying to figure out what's important for them, which can be really difficult. Let's say you have more than this one client you're working for. Then you maybe have 10 clients. Five say this is super important. Five say this is not important at all. So what do you do? It's not that easy, right? And to be able to order, you need the importance, like how much business value does this have for the customer, and you need to have the size from your development team. If two things are of equal size, you do the thing with more business value. If two things have the same business value, you start with what's the smaller thing to implement to gain the same business value. You try to measure business value somehow, and you can only do that by talking with your stakeholders to find out what the business value actually is. This is what you might do if you have a large user base. This is a screenshot of Microsoft uh, Developer Division doing some preparation work for TFS 2010. And they have invited a selected group of, um, well, large customers, basically. This is a large customer meeting where Microsoft will present them 10, 20, or 30 ideas where Team Foundation Server could go, and they can vote on it. And they will collect those votes and then try to prioritize 
by that list. This is not the only group Microsoft is asking. So they're asking one group like this, customers. They're asking one group which are the MVPs like me. So if you tell me things, I go there and I vote for you, kind of. We are 100 something MVPs worldwide. And there's a third group, which are you all. There's a website on user voice where you can go and vote too. So all those three sources are collected so that Microsoft can do the ordering correctly. So if you have more than five maybe customers, you might want to think about sitting down with them and do meetings like this. This was the sheet that Microsoft used. So basically you had four columns. One was how important is this, this idea for your business? Is it most important or least important? And you only had five green stickies for the most important column, column and five red stickies for the least important. So you had to choose your top five on both. Like those are the top five areas I'd like you to invest in and those are the top five areas I don't want you to spend time in. This is what they have done on this one. Does the functionality that already exists in the product meet your needs? Yes, no, don't know. And is this generally the right direction where you want us to go, or should we look for a totally different alternative? So if you're doing some, such a meeting, you might uh, copy this one. You're getting the presentation. Uh, you, you're free to do pictures, but you, you really get this. No worries. It's already uploaded. And at the end, it looks like this. You see on the wall, the green stickies are the most important, the red ones are the least important, and the blue ones are just to answer the, the other columns. And then somebody collects the outcome, basically what are the top five importance from the whole crowd and the top five areas we should not invest from the whole crowd, and they delete all the detail results, how they got there. This is the user voice site. If you have not used it yet, user voice is a site um, that is not uh, hosted by Microsoft, but you can use this for your own products too. And Microsoft is using that for the Visual Studio team. So you can go there and actually vote. You get 10 votes, and you can vote on each idea with maximum three votes per idea. You can insert new suggestions. This is not a way to enter bug reports. It's only a way to get new ideas into Visual Studio. And actually, Microsoft tries to focus pretty much on that list. If you look on the updates that Microsoft is releasing for Visual Studio, they more or less take the top five or top 10 or top 20 items from this list. If you really want to do some impact, go to this site. And you see for Visual Studio and TFS, the number one issue, this screenshot was taken last week, is bring us back the old pending changes window. And the second one is finally make it possible to rename team projects. Sounds familiar? So if you want to vote on those, feel free, visualstudio.uservoice.com. So those are ideas how you can uh, talk to your clients in, in different ways of forms and games to find out if it's more than a single client, what are their priorities, what is more valuable, what is less valuable. And at the end, you try to put that into one list. This would be the product backlog item. This is how it looks in the current update three that was released yesterday. And you can bring that all in order. And this is a flat list because you want to order things, right? You have to have this one order and the most important part at the top. When you start using a product backlog, you immediately get a few advantages. Everyone else in a company can see what is on your backlog. They can see what you're working on right now. They can see what you would probably be working on next. And they can even ask, well, when will my feature will be done? If it's like in the middle of summer, I know, OK, I have to wait a little bit. But you have a lot of transparency now. Nobody has to ask you explicitly what you're doing. Everyone knows what you're doing because you're making this available through a product backlog. There should also be only one product backlog if possible. This is the Scrum template, the default template in TFS, and it puts bugs and new ideas on the same backlog because you have to order bugs versus and, and uh, balance out uh, bugs versus new ideas too, right? Should your team spend time on bug fixing or is it more important to do new feature work. Besides having a product backlog, which is a great thing to do, you can also have the one product backlog assistant or manager, so one guy who's actually responsible to getting that in order and to talk to customers, something that Scrum would call the product owner. Um, he's allowed to have a lot of assistants if he needs them, but have this one guy whom you can ask about everything requirement related. He will be your chief customer representative and he will talk about, with the customer all the time about priorities. And his job is on a daily basis to sort this list so that the most important stuff is on the top. So at some point, somebody might actually ask you, when will your software be done? Or when will I get feature X? To be able to do that, Scrum suggests looking at the 
um, past few iterations or sprints and then doing a forecast and predict the future. Will that work? Well, guess what? Does the weather forecast work? Sometimes it does. It's not the worst thing to think, okay, today it's sunny, tomorrow might be sunny too, but it doesn't always work, right? So it's still just a forecast. But what they do here is they look at the last sprints. In this diagram, you see we have two sprints already completed with 35 requirements and 42 requirements. And now in the current sprint where we're um, in the middle of, we see that the green bar, 18 requirements are already done and 23 requirements are still to do. Those are not actual requirements, but the requirements are weighted with a number, so-called story points. But anyway, you're looking at your performance of the last sprint. Then you take that performance, apply it onto your product backlog, and now you see where, where you will be roughly if your velocity, your speed will not change. That means your team is not changing, your tools are not changing, you're not doing a lot of more support work besides, or not working on 10 projects at a time. Uh, then you will see where you will be. Like sprint two, you will have the first two product backlog items. Sprint three, you will get the next three. So the blue lines are always important ones. In this case, we defined that the first release will be after sprint six. This is why we got the bold black, uh, it's blue actually, blue line that shows you the release line. Okay, now you have priorities. You, you brought your backlog, your ideas into order. Now the team can finally start doing some work. And again, you can do everything right and everything wrong here. Um, and on the one hand, you want to be really quick to be able to have a first, I don't want to call it prototype, but a first working and tested version that you can show your customer so he can tell you, no, it's not what I wanted. You want to be fast here, run a short cycle. But on the other hand, we said already, oh, we have a definition of done. We want unit testing. We want all the nice thing you can apply to software quality. And this is a balance you have to find. You want to be quick and you want to have super high quality, and somewhere in the middle is the truth, probably. Same for architecture, infrastructure, and stuff. And the sooner you see that what you're just coding right now is causing a failure later in production, or your customer will be unhappy, the better. The sooner you realize something's wrong, the better. Ideally, you would actually have Clippy in Visual Studio. I imagine you write a line of code, Clippy comes up and tells you, you know what, I think if you write this line of code, it might compile, even your unit test will be green, but I think in production it will not work. Or I know your customer better than you, he will not like this. This would be my ideal add-on for Visual Studio. Unfortunately, it's not done yet. Um, if you want to do it, I'm happy to show you some APIs to start with. But as long as we don't have Clippy in Visual Studio, we have to use, use other tools. And there's a lot in Visual Studio already that you probably know that helps you giving you early feedback. For example, IntelliSense. In the middle of writing a sentence, a line, IntelliSense tells you, if you write it like this, I'm sure it will not compile. And IntelliSense is hopefully right. Then there's a compiler. Compiler is good, but it's more like a spell checker. He only looks if you wrote, written it correctly. He's not really giving you some semantical um, great results. Then there's a developer test pass. I hear from many developers that they are not responsible for testing. So let's define what testing actually is. There are two points of testing. One is technical testing. I wrote some code as a developer. I have to make sure this actually works and does what I hoped that it worked, right? And I do this by doing unit tests, by writing new unit tests, by updating existing unit tests. I have to make sure it's technically correct what I have written. No one else is responsible for this. If you do pair programming, okay, another developer could, use it, could do it, that's fine. You can start with unit tests if you like to, or start with a production code, I don't care. But you have to be sure the developer tests it for technical correctness. The real tester is looking at the requirement, at the acceptance criteria. He's just checking, have we fulfilled the customer goal and needs, actually? Um, who's doing unit testing? My favorite question. About the half. Who's really happy with the coverage of his unit testing? Just very few. Uh, who's uh, writing the unit tests first and then the production codes, like test driven? Oh, wow. It's slightly going up. Very good, yeah. The statistics are getting better each year. I like that. Um, basically, for those who have not decided yet if they want to go with unit tests first or code first, um, when I was a developer, I did like to write code, but I did not like to write unit tests. So if I start with a production code, and then there's this part I don't like. I would postpone it to tomorrow. 
and tomorrow it's not more fun to write the unit test for yesterday and postpone it once again, right? So it's, it's like with everything in life, if you have two activities, you like one, you don't like the other, start with the one you don't like and then add the one you like. If you start with unit tests, you cannot skip them anymore. It's another advantage of doing it and there are a couple of more advantages. Then you do the check-in. Hopefully you run a set of unit tests during check-in. You might do continuous integration or gated check-in. And there's integration testing. This is now the more interesting test run that don't only look at the static version of your code, but do you, they need a really installed version of your software. And you can use lab management in TFS to deploy your application to a test lab where the unit test will run. Visual Studio will take care of everything. You just have to set up a lab, sorry, a lab build, which is the second uh, build definition. So you have one build definition that actually builds your code, puts the DLLs on some network share. There's a second build definition that grabs those last output from your build and runs a lab build, which means automated deployment, automated testing. You have to write the tests and deployment scripts, obviously, but all the rest infrastructure will be taken care by the Visual Studio agents on that machine. You need Microsoft Test Manager to control all this. And this is a pretty neat thing. If you uh, want to use a search machine to find a presentation on lab management, it will really help you uh, get kicked off with that. Once you have a test lab set up, you can do other, uh, other kinds of testing, like the illity testing, which means like, well, not maintainability, but uh, scalability, performance, everything that you want to do as in an environment that looks very close to the real production environment. The closer you are, the better. Some people do that on the real production environment. Yeah, it's possible. User acceptance testing. The earlier you do it, the better. Ask the user, here's a result. You don't have to wait to the end of the sprint, right? In the middle of the sprint, you can go to a customer and say, this is what we have so far. Does it look like you wanted it? Oh, no, you have to move the logo to the other side. And I like the buttons in pink. OK, you get the buttons in pink. Glad I asked you today so I don't have to do the next sprint and I can fix it right now. So you can shorten down the cycles the earlier you go to your customer if he's willing to give you feedback on that regular and uh, frequent intervals. Operational acceptance. Your production team might also have some things to verify if it's working in production correctly or not. Uh, this is the next thing. The longer you wait, and you probably know that, the less fun it will be to fix something and the more it will cost you. So ideally, when you write code, and you can do that with Visual Studio today, you would write just a little bit code, a few lines, maybe a method, and then you will add a unit test. Whenever you change code, you will have this unit test that will run and verify that what you have done is still correct. So even if you don't have unit tests today, think about it, what if you would have unit tests? that actually pretty good cover your code. This would mean you write a little bit code, you do something in the uh, code editor, and automatically on compile, Visual Studio would run all the unit tests you have and tell you, oh, just the last line you changed, by the way, now you have a unit test error in some other module. Oh, that's good to know. Now I can fix the line I, just, uh, I was just working on. Fixing one line, Visual Studio runs, after compiling, Visual Studio runs all the unit tests again. This is pretty fast. Um, and it's called the continuous test runner. It's the button on the upper left in the test explorer window. If this is clicked, he will rerun all your unit tests after every compile. And this is how um, Microsoft has built Visual Studio to support you while coding and writing unit tests. If you haven't tried so, you might want to do that. You can also do code reviews if you want. You know that this is new in TFS 2012. But even if you don't do code reviews, it's still possible to look at the same screen with a couple of people. This is not forbidden by Visual Studio. It's still technically possible to share a screen. Um, but if you can't share a screen because a distributed team or someone else is going to do the review later, or you want a very formalized way of reviewing things, then you can use the built-in code review request feature in TFS, especially with the new compare and merge windows, right? Have you seen the new compare window in Visual Studio? After 15 years, Microsoft changed the compare window. You can be happy now. Well, it got better from last time. Probably was the country drinks yesterday, right, that made you that tired, is that? Yeah. Um, some people and some teams like to do daily meetings in Scrum called the daily Scrum meeting. And this is actually also a way of getting early feedback because on the daily Scrum meeting, you do two things. As a team, you try to find out, are we still on plan? Are we still on track for the sprint? 
And the other thing you're trying to find out is, do we have any issue, any problem, any process issue that blocks us from getting ready and getting uh, into production with what we're doing right now? So it's a maximum 15-minute meeting. If you have problems keeping up with uh, less than 15 minutes, it's pretty easy. Just move the meeting into some place where people don't like to be. Like, you can do meetings in the toilet. Um, it has to sting somewhere around, or maybe it's very cold there or something. You can move the meeting into a time that is not convenient for people, like right in front of lunch break. You would be amazed how short meetings can be if they're right in front of lunch break. So there are many tricks you can use to keep that, uh, that meeting short. It's not a discussion meeting. It's more a everyone reports what he has done to the rest of the team, and together we ask us, are we still on track? Do we have any problems? The three magic questions are, what have I, every team member answers those, what have I done since yesterday, what will I do today, and were there any process problems or impediments on my way? It's not a typical status meeting where we report to somebody like the project manager, we report to ourselves as a team, and we don't try to solve any problems here, we just try to identify that somebody has a problem, and then we try to solve this afterwards, maybe in a one-on-one -on -one meeting or during the lunch break. The product manager or product owner should not attend. This is a team meeting where the team tries to organize itself and to replan the day. I'm not sure a project manager would help them or rather uh, distract them from being focused on their actual task. Many teams like to use a task board. This is the task board from update three where you can see in uh, yellow are tasks, work items, and you can immediately see where the status is and you see all the items going from the left to the very right. You can put this on a touch screen on the wall if you like. And many teams also like to look at a burndown chart. A burndown chart shows you how much work is left on every day of the sprint so far, although this does not really look um, real, right? I mean, a real burndown chart really looks different. It will probably start like this, and then the second day it would go up because you discovered what you have not discovered yesterday. Then you start working, you're way out of the ideal line. And then at some point in the middle of the sprint, you realize, gosh, there's still additional work we haven't figured out. And you add this too, and then you're way high above. And yes, so this is a very healthy version that is not real. It was not a real team. It was constructed just for this talk. Um, your burn down shots would definitely look different. But still, it's one set of data. You all look on the same chart, and you can now ask yourself, do we have a problem? Do we have to alert somebody that we will not finish all features we promised? Now we go to testing, and now with testing, it's not the development test anymore. Testing is now um, from a customer perspective. Have we solved his problems? Have we done his idea correctly? And there's one cool feature. If you haven't tried out, please do so. It's called exploratory testing, or how I like to call it, it's testing if you don't have any time. And this is good, right? If you go down to short cycles, sprints, how long are those sprints typically? How long is your sprint? Two weeks? Three weeks. Two weeks? Anyone less than two weeks? Okay, how, how much? One week, okay, how long, good. Anyone, uh, yeah, more than three weeks, probably we have more than three weeks, right? You have uh, four weeks? Okay, it's also pretty good. So think of two weeks for an example. Two weeks are how many days? It's 10 working days, right? Minus the meetings of Scrum, let's say nine working days. Minus some critical bug fixing you have to do, minus some other housekeeping things you have to do, other meetings in the company. Um, minus the time you need to talk with your product owner, the so-called uh, backlog refinement or backlog grooming, where you talk about the new requirements coming in. This is going in parallel to the actual sprint development time. So basically at the end you end up maybe with seven working days per team member, and you're trying to get software completely done, right? You take one customer idea, do the architecture, do the development, do the testing, and ship it. And this is not easy. And it's not a lot of time, right? So if you go with a typical testing solution, you would create a test plan. You would set test configurations. You would create a test suite. You would select one or more test cases. You would create new test cases. And then the sprint is over and you haven't yet tested because you were just defining what you would test if you would have time. So there is the new, I have no time, can I test too? Yes, you can, function. You boot up Microsoft Test Manager, and as you might know, this one needs a connection to TFS, so you cannot work offline or um, yeah, save something offline or anything. You have to have a direct connection. You go into a team project. You create a new test plan. Um, no time for testing test plan. 
it will be assigned to you, the logged in user, and they already know the end date. I like that too. They're calculating an end date. I don't know how they do this, but they know how long you will need for testing. And I think it's, uh, the logic is like it just adds seven days to the current date, which actually makes sense. It tells you only have seven days to test, get going. Now you're in this uh, testing tool here, and you can now start creating some interesting uh, test scenarios, or you just right click and say, you know, I have no time, let's just explore the application. And test manager will minimize itself and open up the test runner on the left. And by the way, it starts video recording of the first screen, if you have multiple screens, the first screen is video recorded, and the new feature in 2012, it's recording audio. So this is very important from a psychological perspective that you as a tester, the developer wants to hear what you actually think about this software and how you want to kill him when you meet him the next time. This is, this is a totally different um, feeling you get as a developer if you hear your tester talking to you. Yes, you can turn this off. Microsoft was actually debating adding webcam support into it. Luckily, they didn't, so it doesn't matter what you wear or how you look like. It's just, um, just the audio. You swearing into the mic. So let's start this. So since we have not defined a test case, there are no steps to follow. We can just do something. Like we can open up our website. This is one of the Microsoft example websites and click through it. Looks awesome. I have to wait a little bit while it compiles. We can write down notes, by the way, like this site really seems whoop, to be a bit slow. Um, you can use text formatting, too. Actually, here hidden, you will find things like this. Oh, it's gone. Ah. This is something you should not show to your testers that it's possible like this, and then you just click through the app and you hope everything's working great, and oh, there's a bug. And now you found a bug. Uh, I, had a, I had an error page. The app crashed. You can create a few screenshots if you like from the whole screen or just a certain part of the screen, and as a good tester, you really know what, you, what the developer will need, uh, maybe the system time or maybe the start menu. It's actually a good thing to do screenshots on the start menu. As you know, you won't have one in Windows 8. So. And maybe even the important part. Now, those screenshots, you can double click them and open them in a professional UI editing tool. If you configure one, if you don't, Microsoft Paint will open. And then you can include some subtle notes for your and hints for a developer to find the actual issue. This will guide them to the right spot on the, hopefully. You can also insert things like how you feel, your tester's mood. This should actually be a smiley. I'm not too good at this. And now those notes are included as well. Now you're done. You create the bug. And there's a process problem in creating a bug because you want to write a very detailed bug report on the one side. And on the other hand, you don't know if you will ever fix that bug, right? Nobody has decided that this bug has value and we will fix it yet. So you don't want to spend a lot of time, but you still want a detailed report. And the nice thing is you only need a title here. Everything else is taken care of about Microsoft Test Manager. And in the latest update, if you look at these steps, he actually has every click you've done, and he even knows where you clicked a button. See how we clicked on Internet Explorer? We clicked on the right menu, we clicked on intranet, we clicked on this link, we clicked on the escalate button. So using this tool, I finally know that on Windows applications, I mostly click buttons on the lower right. I have never noticed that before I haven't installed that tool because it shows me where I click. I tend to click on the lower right. OK, app is crashing, a very meaningful, helpful description to the bug like this. Who will be able to fix this? Let's let do Brian fix this. OK, this is it. Um, you get a full-fledged steps to reproduce list. You also have the video as an attachment, the screenshots, all UI clicks, and you can hit Save. 
the default save button automatically opens up a new test case form. So it does not only save, but it creates a new test case. It tells you, like, you found a bug now. Wouldn't that be a test case that you want to run in future every time before you release, maybe? And he will write the steps for you because he knows where you clicked. And here's the test case. And he has all the steps in there. The only thing we have to add here is the expected result. The expected result is it should not show a 404 error message. That would be nice. And we can use formatting here too. Make sure they understand it should not show an error message. And I guess the first two things are not too important. Let's get rid of those. And this is my new test case. Escalate link does actually work. Save and close. So this was our exploratory test session. During the session, we found one bug and one test case. You can see them here. And in the future, we can now also run this test case if we want. It's a pretty nice feature. And again, the bug has all the rich information attached. You, as a developer, you will find all the attachments not on the attachments tab, because this would be logical. This is not logical. You will find it on the links tab. You will find attachments, right? And there you have the three screenshots. You have system information. You have the action log as an HTML file and the action log as a text file. The action log is basically nothing else than exactly the steps that Windows has seen. You have clicked on Internet Explorer menu in the window jump list. Oh, nice. You have clicked on this button. You have clicked on this link. You have clicked on Escalate. So you will really see all the keyboard input, all the mouse movements of your testers. So even if you haven't considered using Test Manager yet, Use it just as a recording tool for bug reporting, and it really makes sense. You get a lot of information. If it's a .NET Framework application, you also get the IntelliTrace file, so the whole, um, basically, stack trace, if you want, that you can open with Visual Studio. Does it look like something you want to use? Does it look helpful? Some nodding, OK. Not too bad. So we actually have teams using those, and it's uh, pretty nice. OK, this is a few screenshots just for you to remember how this looks like. Oh, you have a question. Yes? Your question was where, where I put those bug work items in the, oh, yeah. It's a longer story. I'll give you a short answer. If you want a longer, you can come to me after the session. His question was where to put those bug work items. Do you put bugs like in the backlog, or do you put them somewhere else? Um, it really depends. You have to have some, some, somebody to decide that. Is this a bug that actually um, will, you will not be able to finish the requirements you're trying to do in the sprint, so this bug is really disturbing you in this sprint, then fix it immediately or report that you, that you have a problem with the requirements you're working on. If it's a bug that you just found in some other module and it's not disturbing you in this sprint, your sprint goal is not in danger, I would probably put it back into the backlog. Now, the next problem is on the backlog. If you have very, very small and tiny bugs, you don't want to see them all on the backlog. You would probably just put them uh, under another PBI just to group them. Like, those are 20 small issues and group them below a PBI. That's something you could do from a management perspective. But um, by default, those are all saved into your sprint as regular bug work items. You can't choose the work item type that Microsoft Test Manager is using. So if you think it's better to create a new work item that is called tester callback, tester result, whatever, test outcome. You can create a new work item type just for what MTM will create after a testing session. There's a nice report uh, included in TFS that you might want to look at. The coolest thing about this report is that it really helps you figure out where you are in the software development process and how far you are. If I would be a project manager, I would not look at a burndown chart. Burn on chart is like a real time stock exchange chart. It just kills you every day, and there's no, there's no real sense to look at this. And it doesn't tell you if you will be done at the end of the week. And this is a diagram of or the, the whole chart here, the report, is showing all the data that TFS has from different databases inside TFS. Basically, you see your requirements on the left, you see the completed and remaining work and the amount of tasks behind it that the developers created. You see how many tests exist, and if these tests were already tested, or ha still have to be tested, or have been tested and are red. And at the end, you even see bugs 
that testers have created with Test Manager and if those bugs have been handled by the team already or not. So you see the whole chain between developmental planning over development, test case creation, test case outcome, and bugs from test case execution. Everything in one diagram. It's included in all the three process templates. It has a slightly different name, but it always ends with overview, product backlog item overview, stories overview, or requirements overview. So now we've done with the testing, we go to the operations. Once something is in production, you want to kind of measure your success and check how it's working. One way to do this is create a custom dashboard. This is a custom dashboard that Microsoft created for TF Service. So they can actually see when you're using TF Service, what are the commands that are run most? Are there many commands that take longer than 30 seconds? Uh, how is that compared to yesterday? So those are live stats. Interestingly, Microsoft told us that when there's an issue with the live service, before any of the indicators gets an alert, it takes like two, three minutes until the indicators see that there's something fundamentally wrong. You see on the right, there's a Twitter feed. Actually, somebody has either sent an email or reported on Twitter that it's not going. That's the fastest mechanism to find out your site is not working. Look into our emails, look into Twitter. It's faster than any other indicators they're using right now. It's kind of interesting. So they're trying to use different sources to find out if this is still working. Um, at least what you want from a live site is to get error information. So if your site is behaving differently or crashing or whatever, you want this information. There are two ways to get to this. One is the IntelliTrace collector. The collector itself is free. It creates an iTrace file, and you have to use Visual Studio Ultimate to open it. So you need at least one Visual Studio Ultimate license. And what the collector does is you can attach to a running web application, for example. You start the collector, and he will see all the clicks on the website, and he will create the full stack trace and an event log automatically for every click. So you even see database transactions opening, SQL statements floating. You get the whole thing back into Visual Studio. And every method you called, every parameter, and every return value. And you can do this on a production machine. It's an X copyable small file that you can download from the Microsoft Download Center and run it on a production machine. It's supported to do that. It does slow down your production machine, so be a little bit careful. But it helps you to find those issues that you cannot reproduce on your test or pre-production environment. IntelliTrace collector on the download center. Another thing you can do if you're using system center, anyone using system center products to monitor their software? One. Yeah, it's not too widely spread right now, at least not between development companies. System center are tools for admins, for IT pros. And if I would be a lazy admin, I would sit down on a large chair, be responsible for hundreds of computers, and I would use this software. Because if anything goes wrong, it would just pop up in my system center operations manager, and I would see, oh, there's a hard disk is full. I need to replace the hard disk or whatever. And what can also happen is that there's an exception coming up, and I don't know what to do with it. And look at this nice feature. Right click, set resolution state assigned to engineering, to you. Now in the background, it sends a request to TFS and it creates a new operational issue work item. It's a special work item type. And again, you get the full stack trace and the exception information everything because System Center is running small agents on all machines. So they can easily collect the local state of the machine because they already have System Center agents sitting on every machine they're monitoring. Now you have the operational issue on the TFS side with all the details you need as a developer. You try to fix this. When you're done, you check in, you set the status to resolved, and then back again in System Center on the lower part, alerts resolved by engineering. Your IT admin will see, okay, the developers say it should be working now, so let's try it again. And he can now monitor uh, the last part. There's one more tool, and uh, the preemptive, the company is also here at the conference if you want to step by the booth. Um, you know them probably from the dot obfuscator. They've done like code obfuscation stuff. And what they added to their product is they don't only obfuscate the stuff, they also create a um, general error handler. So all the exceptions will be catched in your applications. And they will be sent to a custom web service that you can host. And it will create a new work item in TFS. Well, not on every crash. They have some logic to group those requests. But basically, you have an application. You don't want to change this. You just want to turn on automatic error reporting. You can do that using their tool. And there's a community edition um, which is f free. And you can add this. Open, if you open up the TFS admin console, there's a link in there to those tools. And you can download that 
and then you get the exception handler. In the professional version, they also do like metrics, um, how much do we use, what feature, how, how many people use module one, module two of my applications, or uh, which page of the application. Okay, now the site is live. We are monitoring it, we're trying to get error information, we're trying to find out how it's doing. Even if it's a Windows Forms app, we still can have dashboards and, and metrics in there. But the last question is, did we really make our customer happy? So is our customer happy? I don't know yet. I have to ask my customer, are you happy? And I can do that by doing the following. I go to the portal and I request feedback. Maybe it's the end of the sprint and I ask my customer, please, dear customer, um, this is my customer, please look at the following site. It's www.intranetfabricam.com. Actually, it's without the Ws. This is the site. Go, please go to that test site and then give me feedback about new the new intranet site. So you create so-called feedback request work items here. Please take some time to review the whole site. And you don't select requirements, interestingly. You just create new items because you want to focus um, the concentration of your client into a certain area. You don't want to present him like, oh, those 20 PBIs we have just implemented, please check those. Like, we changed the color, we moved the link or something. You really want to tell him, okay, in this module we have done something great. Please look at this and this specifically and give us feedback to that question. So you always create new items. You don't use your requirement work items for this. But you can later link it to the requirements if you want. This will create an email. And this email goes out to the customer. And we will get this email in a second in a secret folder here. This is the manual way of doing emails. It'll take a few seconds. If you have any questions, this is a great time to answer them. Was anything helpful so far in the presentation? Any tools you want to try? Who wants to try storyboarding after the session? Who liked that? OK, a lot. Who wants to try the exploratory, I have no time to test testing experience with Microsoft Test Manager? I practice that sentence a lot. OK, thanks a lot. And there we go. And what you will see here is the third tool you might want to try. It's the Microsoft Feedback Client. And as a client, you will get this email here. And it will ask you to start a feedback session. You have to install, however, the Microsoft Test Manager once. Uh, not the Test Manager, the Feedback client or feedback tool. It's also in the Microsoft Download Center. No license is required for my client or my stakeholder to start this. And it looks a little bit like Microsoft Test Manager, just it's only recording video and audio and not more. So this is the starting site. Please open the site. OK, here's the site. Next. Please give me feedback about the new intranet site. OK, let's start the screen recording. Let's click through the site. Let's delete something. It actually worked. Let's escalate something. Ooh, again, same, same problem. We can do the same thing with screenshots and drawing on screenshots, you know. Entering some comments. And what is very important, um, you know that in the, in the United States, it's very important to always have like a rating, stars for everything. You know that from Amazon and all the sites. You have to rate everything. So you have to rate this with one to five stars, how uh, much you like that feature. Let's say he, uh, he liked the crash with four stars. And if there are more questions, you can ask more than one question, then he will be guided through all the questions now. Now he answered all questions, and all the video will be packed, compressed, and sent to TFS in the background. And now I go back to my TFS site, and I create a new work item query after waiting a few seconds. Uh, where are we? We are on the wrong subpage. We create a new query, and I want to see all feedback request work items. So those were the questions we had. And below that, interjoin them with a feedback response work item, response. And show me that as a list. Refresh. Here we go. 
So in total, there were three questions asked. The last one was feedback about the new intranet site, and one client responded. I can look at his response. I see there's a video attached. I can run the video if I like to, or look at the screenshots. Yeah, video is not too interesting. You've seen that already, right? And now the last thing you will do is you connect this feedback response to a new work item because this is what you got from your customer and you now create a new related work item of type bug. Please fix this bug and you place this on the backlog maybe. So now if somebody looks at the backlog and asks you why is this bug so, so much rated, so much um, has such a high priority on your backlog, you can say, well, it's linked to a feedback response we got from this and this client. So now all these feedback responses which were not created or not linked to work items are now linked to your product backlog items and bugs and now you have a clear traceability chain back from customer response to your new requirements on the backlog. Something you want to try? Who wants to try that? Yeah, a couple. So we're almost done. You have all the screenshots in here if you want to show that to your boss or somebody else in your team who might be using that. Uh, Microsoft, as I said, is doing those short cycles. So in update one, for example, there was a new board introduced and a new diagram introduced. So Microsoft is really trying to every three weeks on the online server, so every three months roughly on the offline TFS, you get a new update with new features. And they're really to, trying to use this continuous de delivery cycle. If you want to get engaged, go to that user voice site. If you vote there, I guarantee you those things that are on the top will be in the next updates. Microsoft is really looking at this and this is their way how they can reach you or talk to me and I'd be happy to um, be your proxy to the Microsoft product team. I created this slide for you. It has basically nothing to do with this talk, but it took me a couple of hours. So really, even if you don't like this uh, slide, be polite and say you like it, okay? It's like Microsoft licensing, what is in which edition? I never really understood and I tried to draw that onto one license diagram. So here you go, you can find it in the slide deck. Maybe now you understand what is in premium, what is in ultimate, what is not. Um, new is that Microsoft Test Manager, the test professional SKU, is this uh, very light greenish thing, is also part of premium. So everyone who has Visual Studio Premium has Microsoft Test Manager, and then he can use the exploratory testing tool. This is pretty new. It was an ultimate only feature in the past. So this is it. Um, if you like the technical part of continuous delivery and continuous value delivery, yesterday there were two interesting sessions. One was really technical continuous integration lab management. The other one was system center integration with Visual Studio, operational issue work item, and, and so on. Both were recorded. If you want to watch them on the web, you can do that. They were yesterday. Please, uh, as, a, as we're doing continuous feedback here, it's the same for the sessions. Um, usually not too many people vote for those sessions, but it's really important that you actually give us feedback. We also like text feedback about the sessions because um, Microsoft is inviting us and if you like the session, vote for us and you will see us again. If you didn't like the session, still vote for us and you will not see us again. It's very easy, but please use um, the chance to give us feedback for the sessions. I wish you all the best with the new tools you just learned. This is your homework, right? Three tools to try. I will check on this next year, hopefully in Madrid again. Enjoy TechEd. If you'd like to talk to me either right now or you go to lunch, and today in the evening we have an Ask the Expert session. We have about um, six people also from the product group from Microsoft who are actually responsible for those tools sitting there in the um, Hall 8 next to the Application Lifecycle Management sign. So if you have any more questions, feel free to join us from 6 in the evening until 8.30, I think it is. Have fun, good luck, and enjoy TechEd.